would be nice to make an Adirondack chair, maybe a pair of Adirondack chairs. We'll see how this first one goes for my new deck back here. And I was thinking of outdoor woods to use and naturally living here on the west coast, redwood comes to mind, but I didn't want to use redwood because the whole deck is redwood and it just seems like a little bit of overkill. So I found these cedar boards at the big orange box home center store and they were reasonably priced and they they look pretty nice kind of a contrast to the redwood i'll just see if i can get a clear coat to finish these with most of the boards in this project are going to end up being three and a half inches wide and i thought about getting three and a half inch wide boards from the store those would be the one by four boards but using these one by six boards allows me to kind of examine each board and find the best areas of each board for different parts of the project in other words i'm looking for like really rough areas i'll keep on the underside surfaces where you won't really see them and here i'm just trying to go through the boards and pick out the the best kind of showy pieces that'll be on the back of the chair and i really want to kind of use those knots to their full potential and kind of highlight those i want to start by cutting out these seven back slats and even though they're going to end up being different lengths on the chair i'm going to cut them all to the same length, which is gonna be the longest slat, the middle slat of the chair. And then I'll cut those down to their shorter lengths once it's assembled. I think this will give me a little bit more flexibility in choosing which slat goes where. Now I can cut these down to their three and a half inch widths just by jointing one side, just kind of shaving off one edge of that board. And then I can flip it over move my rip fence in and cut it down to its final three and a half inch width. And this is where I can pay closer attention to which side of the board is gonna be the keeper side, the, the showy side with the interesting grain and knots, and which side will be the well, cutoff piece for, I'll use those for other parts of the project. If you've seen me use my tapering jig before, I had to modify it a little bit for this project. Normally I use this jig for cutting tapers on table legs, which are gonna be much thicker than the boards I'm cutting for this project. So I usually have two pieces of this plywood here, which raises these clamps up a little higher, but these are just screwed down so that I can remove that piece if I need these lower. The second thing is this little cleat down here at the end, I usually use this short one right there, but this time the board is gonna need to come all the way out to two inches on the second cut. So I needed to extend it by making this longer piece and screwing it in place. Plus I added a longer screw. I think I had like a two inch screw in there before. So this one is a three, three and a half inch screw, something like that so that I have a little bit more room for adjustment. It's okay that there's no support down here because it's gonna be supported up here with these clamps and that should be fine. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna draw out what I want that taper to look like. It's not really necessary because I could just set this set screw at one inch in on each side because I want this to come down to a one and a half inch taper. This is a three and a half inch wide board. So an inch on each side. So uh, first thing I wanna do is figure out which is the better end. I've cut these all extra long, and this one looks pretty good on both sides. Some of them aren't so good on one side, so that'll be the top. So we'll, we'll call this the bottom. So what I wanna do here is make a mark at one inch in over here, and I can do the same thing, one inch in right there. Then I can measure up. These are all, these slats are gonna be 34 inches. So this is gonna be the top right here. But the taper, because these are gonna be curved up here at the top, the actual taper is gonna start down an inch and three quarters from that. So it'll be inch and three quarters. So right there is where the taper begins. Like 
I'll go ahead and make a mark up here just so I know where the top is. So this, this is going to be cut rounded, something, well, probably better than that. <laughs> I don't really need to draw a line here, but I like to have some sort of a visual guide too. Now what I need to do is set this screw in an inch. Okay. So this will set in here and the bottom of this is gonna just butt up against that set screw and then it sets against this cleat like that. So this will be my first cut. And lock that down there and there. Now what I need to do is set it to where, set my rip fence over here to where it's gonna start cutting into this wood right at that top mark. So about there or so, that's good. I'm gonna to have to adjust this for the other side taper. So I think what I'll do is I'll cut all seven of these boards, just that first taper now, so I don't have to mess with anything. So with the taper cut on this side, now I need to flip it over so that I can cut the taper on the other side. That just means I need to extend this out twice as much to make up for that missing part. So I'll extend this out to two inches. With all of those tapered cuts made, I'll use a compass to draw a half round curve at the top one side of each of these boards. I'll cut those all out with my jigsaw and then sand them smooth. And I'm gonna use my router to make a chamfer along the edge of almost every board in this project. Recently, a chamfer has become my favorite edge profile. I've been using it on everything. I really like its simplicity and kind of its classic, sophisticated look. I cut out pieces that I'm going to use to make the frame of the chair, and I'm going to drill pocket holes in three of these. These are all going to be cross braces that are going to hold together the two sides. The two sides are, are really the back legs, I guess you'd call them. So what I want to do is attach these back slats to this board and kind of fan them out. So I think what I'm going to do here is just lay it out first before I attach anything. I've drawn a center line on this board and I'm going to be attaching it with the the bad side facing up, since this is gonna be the, the back of the, of the chair. So I'll just see if I can center this and square it up first. It's a little tricky because I can't just use my square here since that's tapered, but I think I should be able to just kind of measure side to side and get it pretty close. So I would say that looks straight enough. So really what I'm gonna do is just kind of eyeball this. I'm 
plan on spacing them about a quarter inch apart, which is this board here. So I can just kind of use it as a spacer. I'm just gonna kind of look at this arc and try to get it to go something like that. On my plans, I <clears throat> put in a lot of different dimensions here to kind of help me figure out how far the spacing should be on each side and you know about where things should be. These are just kind of estimates to get me in the ballpark. The main thing I want to be concerned about is that I have room for the arms of the chair because once this thing leans back, those arms are going to come up to somewhere around in here and I don't want those to hit these side pieces. So in other words, I've got to make sure that I don't spread them out too far. Here's what I ended up doing. I made a mark on this board, inch and three eighths. And so that's the distance I'm bringing each of these boards down from the board next to it. So, and it, you know, it doesn't have to be exact. So I can get those lined up. I can use the thickness of this board as a spacer between these boards. And then just to double check that I've got the same amount of space on this side and this side, I've got a mark up here, inch and three quarters, inch and three quarters. None of these measurements have to be precise. I mean, just, just don't drive yourself crazy trying to do this. It'll all look good in the end. So there's what the curve will look like. Also, I'm using exterior grade wood screws, so hopefully they'll last a little bit longer. Now I can trim off all of those extra long tails. With that assembled, I'll cut out this board to use as a brace to hold the top parts of all of those slats together. It doesn't really need to be positioned at any exact location. I'm just kind of putting it where it looks good and it'll provide support for all of those slats. By the way, that drill bit I'm using is one of these has a drill bit and it's got like a countersink built into it. So you can drill the hole and then it finishes off with that nice little beveled countersink so that when I drive the screws in, they sit flush with the surface of the board. I could just drive these screws in flush with the surface without adding a countersink. But sometimes what happens is they the heads of those screws will kind of crush the grain of that wood a little bit. It just doesn't look quite as nice. Here I'm cutting out the rear legs of the chair. The rear legs are also the seat. It's sort of what defines an Adirondack chair. So this is going to be a frame made with the two legs and then three cross pieces, the ones that have those pocket holes in them. What I need to do here is drill a hole towards the front of each of these legs. It's going to hold a carriage bolt that will also hold the front legs into position. So whenever you have to drill two holes or a hole in two different boards that is going to line up, I mean, think of it like an axle. The best way to do that is to clamp those boards together and drill the holes at the same time so that you're almost certain that they're going to line up properly. The placement of this hole is pretty important because it sort of determines along with the length of the front legs the angle of the chair itself. So if you're using my plans to build this I would follow this as closely as possible the location of this hole 
And if you're going to use a drill, this would probably be easier to do with a drill press. You'd be sure to get an exact 90 degree perpendicular hole through both of these boards, but you can do it with a handheld drill like I'm doing here. Just take it slowly and try to just look at it from all directions and make sure that you're going straight and not crooked. And now I can start to assemble the seat slash rear leg assembly. I wanted to use pocket hole joinery for this part of the assembly because they are gonna provide a lot more strength than if I was to drill a screw in through the outside of those legs and then into the end grain of those cross pieces. And all of these pocket holes are on the lower inside of the frame, so you're not gonna see any of these. With that frame built, now I can drop this back into place and screw it into position using the pocket holes that I drilled earlier. In addition to those pocket screws, I thought I would add some screws into those back slats themselves just to make this extra strong. With that assembly made, all I need to do now is cut out a whole bunch of these inch and a half wide strips for the seat slats. If you're the type of person who has a need for everything to be exact, you could attach these slats by putting a spacer in between each one and making sure that that distance is the same on all of them. But it's just as easy really to just kind of look at it and eyeball it. Remember, when somebody is looking at this chair or sitting in this chair, they're never going to notice any discrepancies between the gaps in these slats. <laughs> I'm attaching all of these with just one screw on each end and keep in mind these screws are real close to the ends of those slats so here it's extra important that you drill a pilot hole. If you don't drill a pilot hole in these the ends of those boards will split. All of the angles in this chair are gonna be 20 degrees. There's a 20 degree bevel I'll cut later and these are gonna be 20 degree miters on the ends of two of these strips that are going to become the arms of the chair. The chair itself will lean back about 20 degrees. These two boards are gonna be the front legs. So I've sandwiched them together to drill a hole that's gonna match up with the hole in the rear legs. Once again, this is where you really want to follow those measurements in the plans. These armrests are going to be flush with the tops of those front legs, but I'm leaving that three quarter inch gap in the front there for the little end cap that's going to provide some extra support for the armrest. This will be a little bit of a tricky spot here. What I need to do is get these arm and leg assemblies joined in with those holes through these holes. So I don't know if I've got a good way of doing this or not. So what I've got here is these two inch stainless steel carriage bolts that I can put through and then a washer on the opposite side and a nut. Okay. Ah. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna just do that. That's not very good either. Maybe I could do it just from this side. How about that? Okay, so. Oh, I guess I should have taken this nut off. All right. 
here you get it, you can you can see these nice stainless steel carriage bolts. You could just use like hex head bolts, I think would be fine. Some sort of something that offers outdoor protection would probably be beneficial. Something that won't rust as easily. All right, so those loosely in there. So the idea is this is supposed to be that way. So these legs, these front legs are gonna be square to the ground, or in this case, to the workbench. Carriage bolts just give it a nicer look than if I was to use like a hex head bolt. So the idea with carriage bolts, even though they just have this round head, is it's got this square part here that when you pull this together, that just kind of squishes into the wood, that square part, and just holds it tight. So you just need to, you just need to tighten up this nut. Just make sure that you use a washer on this side so that it, it spreads out that weight and that the nut doesn't cut into the wood. Here I'm tipping my blade to a 20 degree bevel. I'll cut out this support brace that's gonna go around the back of the chair and connect the arms. I'll cut one of those bevels and then I can line it up with the armrests and just make a mark where I want the other bevel to go. I mean, this is one of those things where you don't really need to cut this at a bevel. I mean, it's gonna be on the back of the chair. Nobody's really gonna see it, but it's easy enough to cut, so I might as well. So I'm just gonna attach this by drilling a couple of holes through that armrest right into the ingrain of that brace. One of the defining features of an Adirondack chair are wide arms. So I'm gonna make these using my tapering jig and I'm just gonna taper one edge of these. These are definitely the widest boards in the entire chair. I kinda of think you could put these arms on really either way. In other words, you could have the taper on this side or this side. I've got the straight side or the square side here and what I'm doing is just kind of lining it up pretty straight with the arm so that the taper actually comes down this way. But I could certainly see, you could probably do it this way also, it would work just as well. I think an Adirondack chair makes for a very nice beginner woodworking project because it doesn't require any fancy joinery. In fact, one of the kind of charming things about an Adirondack chair is that usually the screws are all visible. Of course, there's plenty of exceptions and I've seen some beautiful high-end Adirondack chairs with some exquisite joinery, but in general, this is an outdoor patio chair meant to be very relaxed. Even though I'm gonna put a support piece right here, kind of an end cap, I think I wanna glue this also just to give it some extra stability. One thing I did is I drew a line on the underside of these arms that's like four inches back from this leg just so I could even them up. Did you hear that? There was a really, really loud crash. I don't know what that was. It wasn't here, it was next door. Since the screws are all visible, I wanna make sure that they are in the same location on each arm. 
So I'm just making sure to measure that distance out. I've got a couple of scraps here. I can cut out a couple of quarter circles for those end caps. I'm going to glue and screw these into place. These are going to give those armrests a lot of extra support. So I picked up a can of this. I've never tried it before. It's called Australian Timber Oil, and hopefully that will protect the chair. I don't want to add any color to it. I think this will darken it up just a little bit, but mostly it's a clear coat, and it says it goes on in one coat, and it's water cleanup, even though it says timber oil. But the way I figure it is, everything is out to kill you in Australia. It's all harsh, and so if this can protect that chair, we're in good shape. And yes, I did end up making a second one. One thing I want to point out is on the bottom of each of these, I added a center brace. That's also reflected in the plans. And this one I made slightly bigger than that first one. It's about two inches wider and it's a little bit higher, which to me, I'm six foot one. This fits me perfect. That one is probably a more standard size chair. This would probably be good for most people, but for me it feels like I'm a little too low for the ground and my legs are up too high. If you'd like to build one or both of these, I've got plans over at shopwwmm.com. Thanks for watching.